Okay, welcome back to Kairos. I'm here today with Dr. John Kleinig to have a conversation about his Christian journey. Dr. Kleinig, welcome to Kairos. So back when I was at seminary, um, Dr. Kleinig was one of my lecturers and one of the assignments that he got us to do was to interview a mature Christian on their spiritual journey. We thought it was about time to turn the tables on Dr. Kleinig himself and to interview him on his uh, spiritual journey. Um, So John, let's start at the start. Can you tell us about where you grew up and your, what sort of childhood you had? No, I grew up on a farm, uh, first of all, uh, in Neukirch, that's the northern part of the Brosse Valley, about 10 k's north of Jeru- uh, Jerusalem, <laughs> New Riot, but... <laughs> Slipping back into lecturing yeah, mode. Yeah. Yes, yes, the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, 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 that was the first 15 years of my life, and then uh, that was no longer economically viable, so the family shifted to the upper southeast, a place called Cook Plains, that's on the road to Melbourne. Um, mm-hmm. You pass through it and barely notice it's there. Um, so I'm a farm boy and uh, you can take the boy from the farm, but you can't take the farm from the boy. Dirt in the blood, they Dirt say. Dirt in the blood, mm. yes, yes. Um, both when I was at uni and at seminary, um, people used to say, you'll never make an intellectual, John. You're too much of a peasant. And I wear that with pride because that's something very much part of my hmm. makeup, a kind of peasant mentality in a good sense. Hmm. Um, a close connection with place, physical things, uh, uh, animals, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, just uh, the natural world. That's hmm. part of me. Um, uh, that I appreciate very much. And it's shaped me. The older I get, the more I realise how uh, deeply that has formed the person that I am. I remember talking to another um, person in their in their very old age, and talking mm-hmm. they're talking about how increasingly their mind and their heart would gravitate right back to where they lived as yes. a two, three, four year old child, even. Yes. And this person had moved around around a lot, and they were thinking, "Where's home?" And they went right back to the start, as you're saying. Yeah, and there's a kind of I don't think it's just one circle. Um, but there's a kind of spiral at various stages of your life. You go, it's not, life's not a straight journey, mm-hmm. um, but you go around and you come to the same place, but uh, it's not exactly. You come and reconnect with your past. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and uh, now as I grow older, uh, the more I, you know, when the mind's got nothing else to do, it goes back to those things mm-hmm. and those memories. Um, and uh, it's not that just you reconnect back with them, but you reconnect uh, those things with all the other things that have happened. Mm, mm. Um, it's part of our living in the order of creation in time, and yet in some way, uh, strangely, and I've thought a lot about this, but uh, know the way it feels, we also live outside of time. Uh, we live in place, but we also transcend place. And I don't have one home, mm. uh, many homes, and yet those places are home to me in the way that no other place is home to me. Mm. And as a Christian home? Christian home, very much so. The uh, uh, church that uh, I was baptised and confirmed in, um, Pilgrim's Church at Neukirch. Um uh, it was the centre of our family life. It was not only our um, church, it was, it's one of the oldest churches, Lutheran churches in Australia. I think it's the oldest or second oldest continually used church building in the Lutheran church. So it's a very old church mm. and has a very deep heritage. And I'm part of that. And I attended a Lutheran school, which was attached to it and did all my primary schooling there. So that's my church home. Mm. And to some extent, that's even um, more important to me than the farm that I grew up on. Mm-hmm. Um, now, say, if I take, show people around, 
uh, my home territory, the first place I'll take them th is there rather than the farm. In, in other ways, then, in your um, family growing up, what did the Christian faith look like? Very much centred on, on the church and, and regular worship. What about in the home? Yes, yes. So um, I come from a very large family, and uh, uh, to understand me, you need to realise that. Uh, my father is uh, uh, very pa well, he's, uh, uh, departed now, um, but a very passionate, fiery man. And my mother is a very warm, maternal uh, woman. And there's eight of us children, and I'm almost in the middle, number four out of eight. So big family, uh, uh, with passionate father, and all the members of the family are rather lively. So uh, everybody... When we were young, or particularly in the teen years, everybody wanted to talk all at once. It's, <laughs> it's a uh, uh, very emotional, lively family, typically Slavic, because I'm not basically German, but Wendish. That's Slavic, and there's, I've got something of that Slavic temperament. Mm. Um, but uh, our family life are, are, are centred around the Christian faith. So uh, it was an integral part of our life, uh, the church was the centre, not only of our family, but that whole community. Almost everybody who lived around there were Lutherans and were members of the uh, congregation. And uh, there were two fo focuses in my uh, uh, early life. There was the church altar, you know, regular church attendance. We'd never miss uh, a service uh, unless something untoward happened. Uh, but Probably even more important, that is the family altar. Uh, daily devotions, every morning, every evening, and uh, you know, grace before and after meals. But that uh, uh, emphasis on the Word of God and prayer. Uh, and, and that, that uh, has shaped my life. Um, so it was life that was centred around uh, worship and centred around God's Word and prayer. And uh, every day began with prayer, every day ended in prayer. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more specifically about that in particular? So Dad was a farmer. Yes. And, and so what did this actually look like? Very practically, did, you know, did they gather the family at the kitchen table? Or, or what did um, morning and evening family devotions look like for the Kleining family? It depended on the, you know, the stage in life. Um, but in the... Uh, uh, main years, that's when we were all still at home. Mm. Uh, uh, Mum and Dad, you know, they're farming, they got up with the sun in the morning and very often uh, we kids were not yet up and they'd have devotions by themselves. But it would be at the end of the meal. Mm -hmm. So uh, 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 the devotion, it would be a shorter devotion in the morning um, and if we had breakfast with them, then we would be... Uh, uh, we would join together with them. Um, and so you had a short devotion and then prayer at the end of the morning meal. But it wasn't mandatory. We didn't have to get up for breakfast. Yeah. Um, but in the evening, the evening meal was family time. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, Dad was a stickler for time and it was always at six o'clock. <laughs> uh, and we were all expected to be there and we all had the meal together, and the meal culminated then in a uh, devotion mm. uh, and prayer. And once a week on Sunday evenings, uh, there'd still be a devotion, but then um, Dad would lead what we used to call the family prayer. And this had a huge impression on me because uh, on Sunday evening, he would pray by name for all the members of our immediate family, mm all our relatives, and both mum and dad come from big families. Mm. So uh, we kids used to sort of joke because it went <laughs> on and on and on, and you had this list of people oh, yeah. uh, that were prayed for once a week, mm. um, and then anybody else who was in trouble. So um, there was that weekly intercession for the whole family. And I can hear in this some of the themes from your own teaching on these topics, particularly that of... There, there, there's a certain structure there, and yet there's also flexibility with this. And Enormous there's, there's, flexibility. Right. And it wasn't sort of rigid, and mm. um, uh, 
but uh, you know it varied. Mm. So there'd be a, a different devotion book at different types of the times of the year. Um, sometimes we'd have a song, you know, it, and it varied when we were younger. You know, there'd be a children's devotion in the evening meal uh, rather than an adult one. That would be in the morning. But it was a, a flexible order, but yet a very definite order. And it was not only a um, devotional order, but it helped to order the whole day. Mm. Uh, and we had that sense then of the day beginning with God and ending with God. Uh, um, a sense of the whole of our life being lived in God's presence. Now, I've always been a Christian, I can't remember not believing. So it's a given part of my life in a way that few people can appreciate. Um, and a sense of God's presence. Not the remoteness of God, but God's presence and living in God's presence. And um, we're a fairly poor family. Um, you know, uh, uh, Dad had to be very careful in managing finances just to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, coming out of the Depression, um, which basically ruined him, like many people, financially. And he married very late in life because of the Depression. And even so, carried huge debts. And, you know, we live close to the edge. Mm. But that sense of living, depending on God's blessing and being blessed by God uh, is very much part of my very being. Mm. And uh, faith as a given, you know, that uh, being a Christian is a state of being, not just a, 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 a something you believe in, or even a way of life, but a state of being. I'm curious too, as you talk about this uh, home devotional life, I'm, I'm thinking of your love of music and, yes. and hymnody in the church and these sorts of things. Was that, is that something that was a part of your family growing up? That's part of the family. My mother used to play a little reed organ, so we'd sing hymns. Um, and you know that was uh, part of devotions. Uh, uh, but also very much part of uh, church life and uh, the life of the uh, Lutheran Day School that I attended. So uh, uh, music, song, particularly singing the faith, was, has always been there. And both my father and mother used to like hymns. And, and, and you know, pretty mum would, you know, during the day would just sing some verses of a hymn to herself, hmm. or she'd sit at the organ with the hymn book in front of her and she'd play it and she would sing. Hmm. Um, but she didn't uh, make us join in with her. It was just there. It was part of the uh, way of life. Hmm. How was that transition as a, as a teenager boarding school from the country? It was terrible. Uh, it, it, it's kind of, and I still... It was Emmanuel College, and I go there, and I really have no strong emotional attachment, even though I spent four years there, and very decisive years. Mm. Um, year 11, I was a prefect. Year 12, I was high, um, uh, head prefect, uh, and formed many close connections, friendships. But uh, emotionally, uh, coming from a warm, emotional family, it was cold. Mm. And it was something of, you know, I had a sense of switching off some of the most important parts of me, the physicality, the emotional side there. Uh, so it was a difficult time personally, but a time of growth, um, how to damp the emotions down. In, in your life generally as well as your faith life, would you say? Uh, learning how to control them. No, that... Uh, I can, I'm a very emotionally intense and I can, can intimidate people with my intensity. And I, if I'm not careful, it still happens, but I've had to learn to scale back that emotional intensity. And if I get a discussion, it's hard for me not to be emotional. Mm. You've probably glimpsed I've noticed, that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but to, 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 to uh, control that emotional intent, it's, it's, it's a mixed gift because it can be... Uh, it's very powerful. Mm. You can manipulate people, but you can also damage people. Mm. 
and you so you and you became quite aware of that in those years at uh, well and, and not so much positive it was, it was just the the feeling of of um, it being an emotional desert hmm. uh, uh, and uh, I wasn't conscious that therefore the result of it was to scale back emotionally and also to avoid uh, too intense emotional um, relationships with people. Um, uh, but it gave me a, a, from being very much in the family and involved, a sense ability to be able to detach myself a little bit more from my immediate social context. And from Emmanuel College then on to Adelaide University? Yes, I um, won a Commonwealth Scholarship. Um, great uh, innovation. Um, and where before that time, very few people went to university and you had to be very either very wealthy or uh, well connected. Mm -hmm. And most of uh, uh, people like me, particularly German Lutheran backgrounds, never got to university. But uh, Commonwealth Scholarship meant that I could go to university. And because the family was poor, um, not only paid for all the university fees, but I got enough living allowance to save enough money to put me through most of seminary. Wow. So it was a real godsend. Um, and I had, didn't have to depend on my parents. Um, but I had uh, that path of scholarship through uh, the four years at university where I did a BA honours. And the university scene, what was that like in terms of your spiritual life? Uh, intellectually, it was just sheer enjoyment. Hmm. Sheer enjoyment. Uh, 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 I loved studying, but most of all I loved interacting with people who were interested in ideas and... Um, uh, interested in learning. From being at high school, where you, if you're a bit of a keeny, you know the way it is, mm. you can't be too keen. Mm. Um, if you want to keep up your social... Yeah, you know, to, mm. to be cool and to mm. be in with it. You've you, 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 you got, you yeah. got to play it dumb and you've got to be interested in... My day it was pop music and uh, fashions and sport and that kind of stuff. It's not Nothing changes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but you couldn't be too interested in books and in ideas and all that kind of stuff. Uh, to be in a place where uh, you could be unapologetically uh, interested in learning and in ideas. So that was a delight. Um, at the positive side, I did uh, started off doing English, German, Latin and history. Uh, and expected maybe to uh, go on with English and Latin, but uh, English and history, but they were so intellectually sterile um, that I didn't continue, uh, but found great delight, and I've always loved Latin, and then uh, landed in on German, and particularly German literature. Uh, so it was a, an interesting time because uh, most people at uni were nominally Christian. And it was, it was a time when, and particularly with the Commonwealth scholarships coming through, um, uh, many of them came from church schools and church background. Uh, and it was a time when Lutheran student fellowships and EU, Evangelical Union, and student Christian movement were very, very strong. Mm. And there were missions to the university, um, now, unapologetically so. So uh, it wasn't so anti-Christian. I mean, you had the full spectrum. Mm. Um, so I came across the first atheists I ever met. Also, I came across the first homosexuals that I ever explicitly mm. uh, interacted with. What, uh, year, what years were these? Uh, what, what years were these? This was uh, uh, 60 to 64. Mm. So just before the Vietnam era. So a pretty significant it time of social change. Oh, mm. yes, and, and it's at seminary is the real cusp of that social. Mm. So it's the flowering of one era uh, uh, no, of classical old university, which had been opened up to everybody. 
and still very much the intellectual disciplines. Uh, the standard of teaching wasn't all that very high. Um, and you had a lot of second-rate intellectuals, you know, people who couldn't make it in Oxford and Cambridge and <laughs> those kind of places was, were English ones that were sent to the colonies and if they couldn't make it in Sydney and Melbourne, they came to... You know, that <laughs> right. kind of thing. Uh, the sciences were, were top-notch. Uh, uh, but... Um, so, yeah, it, it was... It was, it was um, not... Un, un, inhospitable to the Christian faith and it, it, the German department was particularly friendly because the professor, Brian Coglan, to whom I owe him an immense amount of gratitude, was Catholic, English Catholic. Um, he, married, he was married to a Jewish woman uh, but who had a soft spot for Lutherans and encouraged um, those of us, and there were quite a number in the German department uh, of German Lutheran background. Um, so uh, it was reasonably friendly. Mm. But I'm, I'm glad you, you brought up Claire because I think most of your students, even if they don't know Claire, they feel like they know Claire because she, she comes up a lot in teaching illustrations yes. and experiences and, and obvious, quite obviously has been a huge um, part of, of your life's journey and a huge influence on you spiritually. I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit more about, um, about meeting Claire and how the relationship developed. Yes, um, my father-in-law, Claire's father, who a, was a high school principal um, and a classical scholar, so maths and Latin were his two subjects, uh, um, used to talk about the value of a classical education. So our marriage is an illustration of the value of a classical education. Um, I knew about her because, I won't go into the details, because mm. she, uh, her family <laughs> was in New York at the time mm -hmm. when we were living there, and then moved to Murray Bridge when we went to Cook Plains. And you know, there's a circle of young people there. She knew about me, I knew about her. Um, and then um, uh, she was uh, doing Latin together with me. So first year Latin, I knew she was one of the group of girls that used to sit in the front of the lecture theatre. Us guys used to sit at the back so that we could eye the, uh, off the girls. Uh, and that was uh, uh, Claire Bentley, Miss Bentley. And... Uh, uh, she was one of the top students and one of my rivals mm -hmm. uh, in Latin. And it was second year uni, we had a very interesting um, lecturer who, who didn't just do the bare linguistics but was interested in the ideas that were actually being um, developed. We were going through a, uh, a poem by Lucretius, a Latin poet, called the, the Nature of Things, in which he expounds um, atomic theory, de Democritus atomic theory. And in the course of that lecture, he um, said, no, it might sound a bit funny, but actually there's uh, 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 this that's had a... Democritus and Lucretius had a huge influence on modern physics and um, uh, science generally. Uh, and he referred to an article in an obscure philosophical journey, journal uh, of a modern uh, uh, philosophy of science guy who uh, uh, analysed his atomic theory. And it sounded interesting to me, so after the lecture I went into the stacks and had to blow off the dust from the mm -hmm. uh, periodical, bound periodical, and sat down in a corral there and uh, started reading it. Claire had another lecture after that one, and then when that was over, she went and looked for this <laughs> article. Uh, whole rows of bound periodicals. And all of them were there except this oh, one was one. missing. She thought, no, that's rather odd. Who on earth would be <laughs> I'd asked a few questions in the course of the lecture and she said, oh, maybe... John Cloning might have it. Uh, so she looked around for me. Um, yeah, 
it's the university was a small place in those days. Mm. We all knew each other by sight, if not personally. And she found that I was sitting there at a table, so she came and she said, do you happen to have this? And I said, yes, here it is. <laughs> and we started talking. And we haven't stopped The talking. rest is history. The yeah. rest is history. Yeah. Um, now we started talking in the library. Um, the librarian came and threw us out and we spent <laughs> the rest of the day talking. Wow. Um, and she decided, you know, women are much better at this than some of those guys. She decided mm. this was it. She was going to marry me hmm. after the first or second day. Mm. Uh, but as part of the atomic theory uh, was that things came about when atoms that are falling through the void parallel um, uh, uh, you know, drift and they coincide with each other and that sets off a chain reaction. <laughs> um, so it's a case of two parallel atoms meeting and staying together. Mm -hmm. So the value of a classical education, uh, it also illustrates physics, the right. <laughs> physics. And a parable of your life, li love yes, life yes, coming. Yes, yeah. yes. And so you're at university, uh, you've met Claire, um, and next big step after that is um, to seminary, Luther Seminary in Adelaide. Yes. What were seminary years like? Yeah, um, uh, I was a pioneer together with another guy called Brian Schwartz, who was a league footballer. Um, and we were pioneers because uh, before uh, our year, um, it was forbidden for seminary students to marry. Mm, so I've heard all these stories. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, when I um, uh, uh, enrolled or uh, uh, investigated enrolling at the seminary, one of the conditions I had with Dr. Haber was that I would be able to be married before finishing because we'd been going out for two and a half years mm. already. Uh, and... Uh, you know, plan was to get married before I graduate. And so, um, uh, hey, but boldly agreed. And so that's the beginning of the rot that set in. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, uh, I um, entered seminary with some diffidence because there was a certain amount of cultural and intellectual snobbery. You know, at the seminary? No, generally in our society. Yes. Okay? Uh, uh, that the study of theology wasn't really academically mm, respectable. Mm, sure. And uh, that to be a Lutheran was even uh, less respectable. So because, I can imagine some disappointment from your lecturers, perhaps, for example, at the, at the university. Yes, most of them said, I still remember colleagues saying, look, you're stupid. Um, Wasting yeah. your gifts. Wasting, you know, you mm. could do anything. Mm. Why waste that? Uh, uh, the church, and particularly the Lutheran church, won't even last long enough for you to graduate. <laughs> uh, it's always been dying. Mm -hmm. And what what a irrelevant institution, irrelevant life. You could do something significant. It's interesting, the guy went on to go into politics and he got himself into a lot of trouble. <laughs> Another <laughs> story. <laughs> Another story. Lots of stories if yeah. you live long enough. Uh, yeah, so it was, uh, and there was still an enormous sense of shame from the two world wars and being mm. German. Um, but uh, as soon as I arrived there, and uh, then within the first month or so, I had a remarkable feeling, a sense of arriving. Mm. This was a good fit. This is where I meant to be. Uh, I still kept the door open at the uni and you know, did some seminars there. Uh, but I think by the end of, by the middle of the year, I closed that door and was happy to commit myself um, to becoming a pastor. And it was a time um, of, uh, I'll come back to the social thing, but it was a time of um, uh, a religious and theological excitement. Hmm. Because uh, in Australia, uh, the Uniting Church had just Methodist, Anglicans, uh, no, uh, Methodists, Presbyterians and Congregationals had got together to form the Uniting Church. Uh, 
Lutherans were coming together, so... so this uh, is mid, mid-60s by now. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. this is 64 to 68. Mm-hmm. So 66 was the union of the church. Uh, so it was the culminating stages where the two former churches were coming together. Uh, and the seminaries then came together completely the last year of... But they came together partially before that, but they came together completely in 68, my last year of seminary. So there was the excitement of that and being part of a, uh, something bigger than two tiny mm. quarrelling little Lutheran groups mm. uh, that were sort of looking inwards uh, had the feeling that you know, we had something to offer uh, on the whole religious, cultural and social scene in Australia oh. and in South East Asia. So it was exciting from a Lutheran point of view, but it was also coincided with the Vatican too. Hmm. And uh, Dr. Zusser, who was one of the lecturers, had a uh, window into what was going on there because of his connections. The leading light in the Vatican II was Cardinal Bayer, who was a personal friend of Zusser's from the uh, church struggle against Hitler. Wow. So we would have news about what was happening in uh, the Catholic Church and in Vatican II. Uh, and the prospects there was just so exciting. Uh, in what ways? Oh, just just Catholic reform. And it looked as if uh, uh, Catholics would become Lutherans. <laughs> you know, that kind mm, of thing. It's mm, just that, mm. that, that uh, 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 men's possibilities. Uh, now, as time went on, Zasso, who was very optimistic, became more pessimistic because he could see some of the problems which have now emerged very mm. closely uh, as... Uh, Case, but it was uh, theologically an exciting time. Um, uh, you know, just in academic circles and around the world, theology was big. Uh, theological departments were f- were filled. Seminaries were filled. Lots of graduates in all, from Catholic churches through to Protestant churches. Lots of students. Um, it's the it was the peak in that. Uh, uh, early 60s was the peak of the post-war revival. Mm. Um, but it was also the beginning then of the collapse that we're part of now. Uh, but that was exciting to be part of that. As I said, I was a member of the first graduating class, mm. huge class, uh, lots of uh, interesting people. Instead of just a small group, you were a small... Mm. There were only two of you one year... Mm. Uh, to be part of a big class is rather exciting. Mm. And there's some very bright people as part of that and very mm. good people. Uh, but looking back, uh, those years, uh, they were pivot years. So 64 uh, was when I entered seminary, 68 graduated. That's the Vietnam countercultural period. Mm. So I have a sense of, of living in two worlds that are basically incompatible. There's the world before 64, before the countercultural movement, before the pill, before the sexual revolution, uh, 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 all that kind of stuff, and the world after. And it's... Uh, uh, at that time, then you get, you know, the, you had the Beatles and pop music, the new music, new kind of art, new philosophies coming through. Uh, were beginning to gather pace mm. uh, politically and socially and culturally. So uh, there are those two worlds, mm. before that and then after that. Confessions. Now you've mentioned Zasser a number of times yeah. and, and, um, and he's obviously a figure of uh, interest in, in all sorts of places outside of our little Lutheran Church of Australia circles here, a man of great historical importance. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about him. What, what was he like? A formidable man. Formidable. Mm. Formidable um, uh, just because of who he was. Mm. Um, uh, a man of immense integrity and a stickler for truth. Uh, he didn't suck up to anybody. And that's partly why he ended up out here, isn't it? It mm-hmm. is, because, uh, look, there's so many stories uh, that I could tell, and it's a very, uh, he had a very tragic life because of the trouble that he got into. 
um, you know, beginning with the Nazis, then after the war, and uh, uh, subsequently a prophetic figure. Uh, and uh, I, I, you know, I didn't realise at the time, but subsequently I owned so much to him, and he mm. filled in some of the other gaps elsewhere. Mm. Um, the gaps in liturgics, the gaps in spirituality, the gaps in the first article... C.K. Bird concentrated on Christology, 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 Christocentrism. Mm -hmm. But first article, creation, not very strong. Mm -hmm. And third article, we never got to in dogmatics. Mm -hmm. And yet, the, uh, as soon as I graduated, then you had the Pentecostal movement came and overwhelmed us, mm -hmm. for which we had no preparation. Because um, uh, basically, the whole of the Holy Spirit in the third article was ignored. Uh, by everybody except us. Uh, and one of the things that he did in a, in a subject called uh, Comparative Symbolics, I think it was, that was you know, studying other Christian groups, was to do a paper on the Christian Revival Crusade, which was a Pentecostal tongue-speaking group. And that uh, helped to save me and, and was... Uh, uh, when I was overwhelmed then by um, the whole Pentecostal movement mm. early in my ministry. Mm. Yeah, so, uh, but Zasa, yeah, uh, you know, uh, what uh, did I gain those years at seminary besides the obvious things? Well, it helped me to understand my own heritage. It introduced me to classical uh, confessional Lutheran tradition. Mm. That confessional tradition and its richness, going from Luther to Chemnitz, from Chemnitz to um, Gerhardt, and that whole classical era, uh, through to Hamann, the man I'm very interested in mm -hmm. now, uh, and then through to uh, Vilma and Lo, and uh, that goes to the origin of our own Lutheran Church yeah. here in Australia. Uh, comes out of that confessional Lutheran revival uh, in the 19th century. Yeah, he, uh, 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 Sasa, but the whole of seminary helped to articulate how rich that tradition mm. was, and that wasn't by any means dead or and done with, but had immense possibilities for the future. And even though it's very hard to, 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 to see the applicability immediately because of the subjectivism of uh, uh, the times from, you know, that countercultural movement, uh, uh, there was the possibility there of uh, uh, dealing with and presenting the faith and living the faith in the new world that was emerging. More again about, you know, we talked a lot about your um, family growing up, the personal side of that. And what yes. about for you with, with getting married and having your own children? I wonder if you can tell me, tell us a little bit about uh, your family life, and particularly how, um, how, did, how did the faith shape your own family and how did your family then influence your, your faith, your spiritual journey? Yes, uh, uh, yeah, um, yeah, Claire was the the backbone of my life, my rock, and uh, uh, yeah, the centre of our home. Um, uh, she's very efficient, well organised. Right from the beginning, she created a rural oasis, and she loves cooking and meals and hospitality. And uh, so that was the focus of our family life: is uh, family meals and hospitality. Uh, Claire loves entertaining, mm -hmm. um, cooking and having people to dinner. And, uh, you know, that was part of our uh, family life too. Uh, we would uh, always, if, if at all possible, have the evening meal together. Mm. And that was the time then for devotions and also debriefing the day and just fun time as a family. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and so looking back, you know, the fondest family memories that I have within my own immediate family 
was all the many meals mm. that we had together. And as our kids grew, uh, got older, they brought their friends along. And many of them were not Christian, and you know, some of them were right out at the edge. They, strangely, you know, uh, when they heard that you know, our kid's you know, father was a priest of all things, they were a bit freaked by it. But once they came, they just loved being with us. And so they mm. enjoyed um, the, uh, the warmth, if I can put it mm. that way, mm. of uh, dinners with us. Mm. Uh, uh, it's interesting how, att how attracted they were mm. to that because many of them came from dysfunctional um, parents with dysfunctional marriages and dysfunctional families. And they could see then... Um, yeah, you know, a functional marriage, not a perfect marriage, but more than that, a functional family. Mm. Mm. Uh, and that it wasn't it wasn't something, you know, Brady's bunch, you know, goody two kind of shoes kind of stuff, but it was fun mm. and enjoyable at the time. Uh, you had four children? Four children, mm. yes. So uh, Louise, the oldest, who's a lawyer, uh, Tim, who is a uh, physician, who's a neurologist, uh, uh, Hilary, musician, cellist, and Paul the youngest, who's also a doctor, who's mm. uh, double specialty general medicine and palliative care, and their family's ten grandchildren. Mm. But uh, the family life's been, not apart from my ministry, but it's been very much integral to my ministry, mm. Mm. Uh, in two, two very clear ways. One is, and that was fairly early in my ministry, just having, when I became a father, by becoming a father, my whole approach to ministry changed. Whereas previously I'd sort of, and I was college chaplain with young, with young people, I approached young people as a friend or as a big brother. Mm. You now that chummy kind of, palsy walsy kind of approach. You wouldn't have been that much older at no, first. No, no, yeah. no. Some mm. of them were uh, just a little bit younger. And I mm. look at them now and say, they're, they're, they're old people. I remember this. <laughs> uh, yeah, there was about uh, four or five years difference mm. or something mm. like that. So in some cases, but uh, fairly close. And, uh, you know, as close as my youngest, say, sister was to me. Mm. Um, but then... Um, uh, uh, as a pastor, ceasing to act as a brother with them, but fathering them spiritually. Mm. And what a difference that made. And I realised then uh, uh, how important fatherhood is. And there's certain things that only a father can do and a person who is in the role of a father and how everybody, not just uh boys and girls, young boys and girls who have no father or bad fathers, but everybody needs to be fathered spiritually. And the model then for uh, spiritual care of people is to father them spiritually. Uh, so that's, it was, uh, that shaped hmm. my whole ministry and the cast of my ministry. And then uh, the marriage in, in, in many, so many other ways, you know, just by mirroring the relationship between Christ and the church. Mm. Uh, it sort of loops. Uh, the more you uh, uh, get to know Christ and his love, the better husband you can be, the better husband you are, the more you're drawn into the mystery of Christ and the church. Mm. You know, that whole mystery of marriage, mm. um, which is uh, lies at the heart of my theology. Mm. And so these theological mysteries and truths that you... Knew at some level you, here, you yeah. knew experientially in your marriage and fathering your children. Yeah, whereas mm. they were nice ideas or mm. ideals, mm. they then became fleshed out as realities. Mm. Uh, yeah. Now the, th the the comments about fatherhood there they are obviously hugely um, interesting in our current yes, times, yes. and so. And so when, when you say things like um, there are certain things that you, you would feel only a father can, can do, do any particular examples come to oh, mind? Oh, look, there's so, there's so many examples, and oh. it's so hard to pin down. Mm. Um, but there's certain things. One is uh, fathers uh, can judge and bless, assess. Mm. Now, everybody wants approval and not blanket approval, 
but realistic true proof, which is and that can only come with assessment. So assessing what's what's right, wrong, good, bad uh, possibilities, and approving the person and approving certain traits. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a father uh, uh, can uh, bless, and the blessing of a father has uh, enormous impact. So whether it's it's I mean, there's so many other sides to it, but mm. most obviously it has to do with uh, guidance, direction, teaching, instruction. It has to do with correction of some kind, discipline. Um, but it also has to do with positive uh, um, uh, affirmation. Um, uh, you know, the affirmation of a father uh, means much more than the affirmation of a mother. Mm. In a sense, mother, it's given. Mm -hmm. um, Father, it's uh, no, it's it's it, mother. It's there, but father needs to be granted, mm. Mm. Uh, and then um, the power that is in father to bless. Mm. Mm. That in short, look, there's a lot yeah, more there. Yeah, no, uh, no. Uh, uh, that we and need the cons to... and the consequent damage when then when the blessing is either withheld yes. or, or disapproval, worse is, from, yeah, or unreasonable criticism. Mm. Mm. Or uh, the refusal to discipline. Mm -hmm. You get young people that are angry with their fathers because uh, they have unleashed chaos on them. Mm -hmm. um, they haven't dared to teach them right, wrong, true, false. Haven't given them a true appraisal of their abilities, and you know, negatively and positively. Uh, that's become very coming out of that is is. Being a father is not just important for being a pastor, but understanding Trinitarian theology mm. and the importance then of the order within the Trinity, uh, the fatherhood of God, mm -hmm. the sonship of Jesus, and the spirit proceeding from the Father through the Son, uh, that Trinitarian order, but the focus on the fatherhood of God, which mm. is very unfashionable. Mm -hmm. It is indeed. <laughs> Ministry and you were out into the college. Um, so your yes. college chaplaincy were your yes. first first one or, or two calls in ministry. Is that right? First two calls chaplaincy. Uh, first of all, at Luther College for four years in Melbourne. Uh, frantically busy years. Uh, uh, the head was a pastor, John Paik, and then there was me. Um, but I had one of the heaviest teaching loads. I won't go into the whole thing, but mm. it, it's uh, very, very demanding. And then um, uh, a much more expansive ministry as senior chaplain, initially at uh, St Peter's College in Indrapilly. That's in Brisbane and for that's our in Brisbane. international viewers. <laughs> yes, it's in Brisbane. And it's a remarkable school in many ways. And uh, at that time, um, Carson Dron was the head who... Uh, was amazing to work with. Now, um, for some of the time, I had other chaplains. Sometimes, some of it, I was the only pastor uh, for a community that was about mm, seven, eight hundred mm. secondary students and about two hundred primary students. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, impossible task to pastor that. And then also, uh, the con the college became the home for a congregation. So I was co-pastor at. Resurrect of the Resurrection Lutheran Church. Mm. That was well in as, your time then? That was, yeah, that that wrong. Mm. Uh, yes. Uh, but uh, I think that's where I learnt the most anywhere in my life. I was challenged, hmm. stretched most, and grew most. Personally, uh, psychologically, uh, culturally, socially, but spiritually too. Hmm. And particular examples come to mind? Uh, yeah, I was going to touch on it a little bit later. But, but basically the whole problem of um, dealing with the occult, hmm. that, that came out very, very strongly. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, it was during that, it was that countercultural period, that turbulent change. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you had... Uh, Intellectual, moral, relativism, drug taking, drugs open, occult, then sexual liberation together with that, which also then opens to the occult. So I was confronted with the occult 
not for the first time. It started at Luther, but this is the this is full on. Mm. So, spiritual warfare, mm. right from the beginning. Uh, I didn't realize at the time I was involved in massive spiritual warfare for the soul of the community, and I am, and I'm... that culminated uh, uh, in the suicide of a girl, a year nine girl, um, who was a boarder. Mm. A traumatic event, um, and there's occult stuff around that, and that somehow uh, uh, shook up. Uh, a whole, the whole community and led to a whole new range of new things coming out of that new mm. growth, new life coming out of that death. Terrible times, and yet um, God brought much good out of it. So it's that uh, uh, confrontation and learning how to deal with the occult. Mm. <laughs>